this time to allow questions from the audience. And uh, uh, not surprised that there's some, there's some hands up. Let's. Uh, what we want to be sure to do is if you want someone specific to answer the question, you ask that specific question. And we're going to try to limit the amount of time to any individual question. Are you going to call them? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's start with uh, the lady behind the lady with the purple the purple bus. The lady behind the lady with the lady with the white bus. You're looking at this. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mildred and I have uh, interest in Bergen County Health Care Center. It's the only facility that the county um, owns. Um, it's a historical location. It's very important because that's where our vulnerable elderly county residents who live on time, pay taxes, work hard. Now they no longer have the resources for the long-term care that's needed for Alzheimer's and other um, illnesses. And I'd like to know what your position is in the county continuing to run moving forward. Anybody want that? Sir, I just have a question for you. You told me about the long term care facility at Bergen Regional Medical Center, right? Yes, in Rockley. Oh, Rockley. Rockley. I have been. Okay, I, I have to admit, I, I, I'm unaware of the center in Rockley. Um, the first of the, my, my typical answer would be is. You know, what are your purposes? I think you're talking about the Bergen Regional Medical Center. To my understanding, the Bergen Regional was not owned by the. To my understanding, the Bergen Regional. Um, was not, it's not owned by the county, but the Bergen County Health Care Center on PMR Road is. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm going to put the first of because I don't know what to do about that rock yet. Yeah, really what well, well, we need to be sure to do, folks, is get a question out within 20 or 30 seconds. We, we need the question on the table. Does anybody want, want this question? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. In terms of the Rockley Center, in a very, very quick way, it should be uh, continued. It does great work. Uh, obviously, you know, it, let's pay attention to the management of the place, but it does great work, and uh, if we could expand it for our growing senior population, we should. Hey, um, gosh, that's all kinds of, let's go to this side over here. Behind you, Mark. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lauren Tola, resident of Tina. My question is for the current uh, incumbent. Can you, can you hold it right up to your mouth, please? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Great. So my question is for the current uh, incumbents. Um, you've spoken about costs that you didn't know of because they were dropped all previous freeholders, and you didn't know about these costs, so you had to take care of them in the you know budget, but and there was no transparency. So I'd like to know what measures you put in place so that there is transparency, and what legislation have you passed so that going forward, there will not be a drop ball in costs for a future board of freeholders so that we won't have this problem again in the future. No answer is no answer. No, no, no. First of all, I wanted to just clarify the question because it wasn't the former freeholders. It was the former county executive who was no longer present and no longer sitting in office. So the, the first thing that we have had is a much more open dialogue with the county executive. That the, it has been a bipartisan dialogue, uh, making sure that we're all incorporated in a lot of these decisions. So we're kind of seeing where the I, how the eyes are dotted and the T's are crossed. Um, but you know, it's it's one of those. I, I think that that's a, a challenge. That and part of the reason why she's no longer sitting in the head executive seat is why is, is the, the uh, issues of these management uh, these management issues. So I, I think that we're going to be doing a lot better now going forward. Um, it's, more so an issue of making sure that that kind of open communication is fostered across the aisle. Does anybody else want this? Just really quickly, I'm sorry, John. I also have asked for oversight for our DPW directors and the department heads to come when these projects are going on to come and give us periodic updates so that we know where we stand. 
so that we don't have this problem. Once we realized with the uh, new bond ordinance, with the correct number on it, there was a problem with the number from that point on, we started demanding that they came in front of us with oversight and give us updates on these projects. That's how we knew that it was the DPW garage that was out of whack, not the Justice Center or the parking garage. So we are making sure that we have oversight on every project that's going on in the county. John? And, and just very quickly, uh, and it's the way the contracts are written with our, with our vendors that come in, we have to put the onus on, on the contractors, not the taxpayer. If there's a delay, if there is a mistake, it should be on the, the vendor or the contractor, not on us, the taxpayers. And right now, the way the contracts are drawn up, that language really needs to be tightened up. Uh, the person beside, beside Nick Lento, the guy with you. Uh, actually, we'll get you next, man. Uh, this is addressed to all of the uh, candidates. Uh, a week ago, actually two weeks ago, if we hold a meeting, the former uh, TNIC firefighter, Bill Brennan, and the mayor of Carl Staten, for the people, raised a lot of serious, very serious allegations against Bergen County Prosecutor Malinelli. This is not the time for you to make a decision on those allegations. But Brennan pointed out, along with the mayor of Carl's staff, that the freeholder board does have the option and has the right, and in my opinion, the obligation, to seriously investigate, if possible, these allegations, which the Bergen Record, the Star Ledger, uh, and the uh, Bergen Dispatch, the Bergen Record has just done a second uh, investigative piece on that two days ago, very lengthy. I think it's built on all of the question okay. 20 seconds. You should all be, I think you're all aware of the situation. What I would like is a commitment from each one of you to take real responsibility to look into this matter because it really, it goes right back to the Joe Ferriero days. Yeah, you're you're we, still making a statement. What's the question? Okay. How, how, to what degree do you think this is serious and to what degree do you plan to address it one way or the other so you're on the record? Thank you. Anybody want that? Sir, I'm sorry, sir. What's your name? Nick? No, no, no. I'm the only candidate who has come out publicly calling for an investigation of the Burke County Prosecutor's Office. I've read what's going on, I see what's going on, I talk to people. There are more people who have stayed silent over some of these issues. Now, there is a very, coming to the seriousness of this, this is the most important issue in this race and nobody's talking about it. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot operate with allegations like this hanging over the Burke County Prosecutor's Office. We need to find a way to clear these allegations. Now, the State Attorney General's Office should be involved in this thing, but we know that James Sweeney, the investigator of the State Attorney General's Office who uncovered some allegations, he was fired for pursuing the allegations. Also, Paul Fishman has been eerily silent on this, or the District Attorney for, for New Jersey from the federal level. We can't ask the prosecutor's office to investigate themselves. What we need to do is clean up our own backyard. We need to commission a private investigation by the freeholders and then make those findings public. Thank you. Tracy, I think you want it next. Um, we, we've heard the complaints and, and, you know, I'm, having been a judge and a prosecutor, I'm not in favor of the politicization of justice and that to take it you know, I, I know that the freeholder chair has forwarded the complaints to the attorney general's office and to the, um, you know, to the appropriate venues. But this, the, these allegations should not be, we're not a courtroom. And, and to turn the freeholder off, the, the freeholder chambers into a courtroom, I, I think is inappropriate. There are, other in venues where this should be appropriately handled, and they have been referred there. John, you want to? Yeah. I was at that uh, freeholder meeting, and, and I came away stunned by what I heard. Um, and my concern is, and, I, and I'm, I'm gratified to hear that uh, Chairwoman uh, Boss has moved this forward, at least for some sort of investigation. But the concern is, and I, and I think this has to be the concern of everybody here in this room, is that with this cloud hanging over the prosecutor's office, the sooner the investigation is conducted, and no matter how it comes out one way or the other, uh, because what it does, it taints, it taints anything that's going through that prosecutor's office right now. So let's get this investigation done at the appropriate levels, and, uh, and then we can move on. Thank you. 
Tom, you want to? Yeah, I just want to say that the Freeholder Board listened to everybody's concerns. We heard one side of, of the stories, and our job is to follow these things and like we did. Now, the State, Attorney, uh, State Attorney General and the Governor, who are the appointing authority, will have all this information. I'm sure they'll do a, much, a, a very good, thorough investigation, and they are the appointing authority, and they are the ones that need to make the decision, and we did, as a Freeholder Board, what we had to do. We listened to the people, we took the information, and the chairwoman has forwarded to the proper place where it needs to be looked at. And that's really, the, that's really what the, we, we did, and that's what we had to do, and we did it. Thank you. Two more questions, folks. Um, you said I Mark? Was next. Huh? You said oh, I, I, said, you said, I did say you were next. <laughs> I apologize, okay. ma'am. Promise is a promise. Promise is a promise. Uh, my question has to do with adding additional personnel to the county roster. And there have been a, a lot of additional people that have been added. Now, I'm not debating who was hired and whether they should be. My question is, government should be run as a business. You should look at the bottom line, and instead of the taxpayers paying for the desires of one person or another, and then we get into who was in office and who wasn't in office, I don't really you care about that. I care mind. about what would you do to ensure to the taxpayers that the government that you're overseeing and the county that you're overseeing is going to run like a business. Daisy. I would just run it like a business and I would look at what are the needs of all the county departments and look at what is the talent that we have there today. And like a businesswoman, I would say, are these the right people in these jobs? And if they are, then why do we have to hire more people just because we owe favors? It looks to me like there's a lot of patronism going on, and that's something that we were against when we voted for uh, Tedesco, whoever voted for Tedesco. So today, that's how I would run Burby County. I would look at what is the need, and do we are we fulfilling that need with the right people in these positions? And why do we have to have uh, added positions if we could do more with less? That's how corporate America works. They work more with less. So, when the county executive did come in, he did realign departments. He did look to do more with less. He looked to find efficiencies wherever we could so that we could cut costs and make sure that we were uh, appropriately fulfilling the work that needed to be fulfilled in the most efficient way possible. But you know, we are looking every day for every dollar that we can cut and for every way that we can do things more efficiently. But government isn't a business. Government is there to provide a service. We don't look to make sure our schools are possible. We don't make sure to make sure that uh, you know our, our senior centers are profitable. These are services that we need to provide, and I'm not in favor of cutting any of those things because I believe that that's the role of government. I agree. The services that the county provides are excellent. But my point, my point is this, is that if we could spend one dollar to help one person, why not spend that same dollar and help three people? I think the idea of bringing efficiencies in and not have a drop off of services is our obli obligations as elected officials to make sure it, it's done. People are leaving Bergen County because property taxes are too high. If we don't look to, to, to streamline costs we're all we're all up against it, so we got to do it much better and more efficient. I, I, I several people before this before this began, and I asked me to make sure that there's a question about uh, the uh, uniform commercial code. Uh, sorry, the uniform construction code and the role that the freeholders should be playing in respect of uh, the, the buildings, the building codes, particularly in light of the Edgewater. Edgewater issue. Does someone have that question that they want to raise? Uh, no one here. I'm not about that. Okay. Did you want to, Councilman? Other questions? Raising his hand, right? Okay. Okay. There you go. With respect to the politicization of uh, of the questions which you uh, stated, you indicated that the freeholders is not a courtroom. Uh, I think what we need is much more politicization. 
Uh, tonight we've had 99% uh, uh, of the uh, candidates speaking and uh, about 1% of the citizens here. Sir, we need your question. I'd like to, I'd like to augment the citizens and say that uh, Sheriff Cocon, as an example, was run out of the Sheriff's office. And, uh, Is that a question? What's your question? That's an example, that's an example of uh, the politicizing, polit po political development I think politicization of candidates. Question, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, I never heard a question, actually, so. Should, should, um, the, should the sheriff be run out of office? Does anyone want that question? <laughs> no. no. Uh, all right, Rose. First of all, thank you to both the uh, Thank you to both incumbents and challengers for your time and energy and hopefully good goals. Uh, you talk about tax. I'm wondering, since you're in charge of a lot of money, but it's coming from over 60 towns, what's the real impact you would have on any individual sitting here and listening to you regarding the possibility of either containment or lowering tax when you're really a minuscule portion of the taxes that are collected by our township and then sent on to you? It's a very small percentage on an individual basis and a township basis compared to a county basis. So again, the reality of it. The question is the reality of a tax containment or tax lowering. I mean, you mention it, and it sounds like platitudes rather than reality. Well, one, one quick thing is I'm happy to say last night that uh, we refinanced five towns that saved close to $4 million by using the BCI. Uh, BCIAs and the county's AAA bond ratings. So that's direct tax relief. In some communities, they're going to see almost a two two point uh, decrease in their debt. So that's one way that the county automatically can help. The other the other aspect of it is shared services. You know, we be, that is what we've been as far as the realignment of the county police, the county sheriff. But it's even more than that. It's go, engaging the municipalities in ways that they can take part in, in, in some of the county services that we provide to lower their individual tax bills within their own municipalities. Yes, we are guarding every penny at the county level and making sure that there's no tax increase. And as you pointed out, it's a small portion of the overall tax bill. But it's coming up with solutions. It's coming up and it's innovating. It's, it's having discussions regarding public-private partnerships and providing and enhancing the services in our lives. It's making Burton County more uh, more accommodating as a place to live by engaging in some of those discussions that we didn't get to, that were on your list, but we didn't have time to get oh, to tonight. Yeah, yeah, we, should, we should have made this two hours. <laughs> but, but those are some of the impacts that the county can really have in, in right-sizing some of the services that we're providing. Okay. Uh, sir, thank you for the, for the question. Uh, in my town of Ramsey, the county tax portion is 11%. So to call it insignificant is, I think, outlandish. I mean, property taxes are driving people out of the county. The county tax portion just went up another 4.3%. Uh, they mentioned the, the BCIA. The BCIA runs on a deficit. It's run on a subsidy provided by the county. That's another area that we should look into to make self-sufficient. If investment needs to be made for another department to, uh, to become self-sufficient so the county doesn't have to keep underwriting it, let's do that. But to, let's not diminish the amount and size that this property tax bill is. Oh, I do want to remind, whether it's a small portion or not, there is $500 million being decided, both in budgetary form and then in actual expenditures and contracts by the crowd that will be running the, the freehold.